from a day-to-day -day perspective, we worry less about uh, the difficulty or the reward amount and more about helping support the network infrastructure, help support the Bitcoin blockchain by getting more machines online and continuing to push this to the mainstream. Since 2016, the global exahash has grown exponentially. In 2016, according to the hash rate index, global hash rate sat at one exahash. Today, it sits somewhere around 600 exahash. With this growth comes expansion in the overall industry as more and more Bitcoin mining is developed globally. And with that, I thought it would be great to have on a site lead from Compass Mining to talk about his day to day and his overall outlook for the space. So Jeff, thank you for joining today. How are you doing? Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. Thanks. How are you? I am well. It is crazy. Those numbers that I just shared in the intro, I had to look them up twice on multiple different things because I had heard that, especially since 2020, the overall global hash rate had increased by 5X, which is a massive amount. But to see that the global hash rate had increased from 2016 from one exahash all the way up to in January of 2020 to 108 exahash, which is an astronomical increase. Here we are today at 600 exahash and I wanted to sit down with a site lead from Compass and kind of dive deeper into what it is that you do every day and probably give people who are listening an idea of what Bitcoin mining looks like from the ground up. So with that said, if you could do your best, and I know that every day for you changes, what is a day in the life of Jeff Bryant, site lead for Compass Mining in the Bitcoin mining industry? All right. Um, I am a man of routines. Uh, I find that Approaching each day with the same tactic is the most efficient approach. Um, we first thing is we just check for offline machines. Really, um, you know, we're not there 24 hours a day. Um, so when we come in, the first thing we do is check to see what's lost overnight. We handle uh, shipping and receiving during the day. Um, a lot of minor diagnosis, troubleshooting, repairs if needed. Uh, a lot of a fair amount of customer interaction. Um, just managing customers' machines and making sure everybody's online. It's not a clean business working in the field. Uh, uh, we do have routines as far as cleaning and filter maintenance and just making sure everything is operationally uh, the most efficient for the machines. Amazing. And before we dive into the cleanliness and maybe the overall what people's perception is of the industry and then the realities of the industry, which is what you just hit on, I want to actually step back a little bit and ask you about your personal journey first, probably into Bitcoin and then into Bitcoin mining. Maybe it was actually the other way around. Maybe you got into Bitcoin mining and that brought you into Bitcoin. But how did you get into the space? What was your first you know, step? I find that most people got in either in the class of 2013, 2017 or 2021. Uh, and those just align with the bull runs or when the price appreciation goes up, the attention comes to the space. Myself, I got in around 2017. That's where I bought my first amount of Bitcoin and started to say, whoa, what is this thing? How does this work? What is a decentralized network? It was the first time I'd come across that. So for you, how did you kind of get into Bitcoin and then Bitcoin mining? Yeah, uh, I found Bitcoin around the same time, 2016, 2017. Um, found it through a friend of mine. Uh, you know, it's it's in interesting how much adoption has occurred because back then I had no friends in Bitcoin and now I have multiple friends in Bitcoin. So it's just cool to see the progress. Um, 2016, 2017, uh, got into mining. Um, at one point ran some small ASICs in my basement until my wife said no. <laughs> and uh, that was my first real appreciation for the technology, the equipment, um, what this means for the future. Um, and uh, I uh, was fortunate enough to serve almost 16 years in the fire service. Um, I retired last year and uh, Compass had an opening. So I knew what Bitcoin was. I was all about it, um, doing it in my house. So I felt like this was a, a shoe in. Um, yeah. So started working with Compass and the rest has just been incredible progress. Okay. So this may be a personal question and maybe we'll take this out if it's too, if it's too, uh, I, I don't know, it, it, touchy, but I want to know what happened, uh, why your wife was like, Hey, Jeff, look, you can do this Bitcoin thing, just not in the house, right? There's maybe some things we shouldn't do in the house, right? Yeah. We shouldn't play like roller hockey in the house. You want to do that go, you know, go in the driveway. So 
What was it that led your wife to say, Jeff, we can't do this in the house anymore or in the basement? And I say that because in 2020 and 2021, I was actually mining uh, some cryptocurrencies in my buddy's basement. And his wife had yeah. similar objections or, or his wife had certain objections. So I'd love to kind of, you know, cross-reference those with maybe your wife's. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that my people that don't mind Bitcoin might not realize is these machines are loud. Um, the fans run at a higher decibel than what you would define as a comfortable sitting environment. So sound management is a huge factor and they also generate heat. So heat is also heat management is also a factor. So in a residential setting, it's you have to have the right criteria. Uh, I was doing it in the unfinished part of my basement and we had extension cords running through the basement and eventually my wife just wanted to use the space for living and not <laughs> Bitcoin. So. Um, I graciously uh, retired those machines, but you know um, that was that was a foundational learning experience because had I not had that, I might not have found this job and this passion. So it is crazy to think about how everyone in the Bitcoin mining industry, this at one point in their life was a hobby, or this was something that was more of a passion project. Mm -hmm. And as the exahash has grown, as I said in the intro, it's gone from one exahash in 2016 to where we are today at over 600 or around 600 exahash. That is where passions turn into full-time jobs. That is where, you know, an at-home project turns into an industrial level event. And you've talked about two things, right? You've talked about heat and you've talked about sound. So now let's go back and talk about where you said, hey, Bitcoin mining is maybe not the cleanest thing. Maybe it can be a little dirty. And I think when people think about Bitcoin mining, they think about it in a theoretical standpoint. They talk about the decentralized network of compute around the world that keeps the Bitcoin protocol secure, keeps the network secure so people can transact. It is often lost on them that these computers are not, it's not like a, a cushy data center. You know, it's not like things you see in the movies where someone goes into a data center and it's pristine and, you know, everything's behind glass and it's, and it's perfect, right? It's perfectly climate controlled. Talk to me about the heat the sound and what it really kind of feels to, to be in a Bitcoin mine. Yeah, absolutely. There are varying types of structures that um, can be used for Bitcoin mining. Um, the site I'm at, we use mining like shipping containers. So these are outside in the field. We're subject to the environment, right? So if it's extremely hot, um, we're putting hot air into machines that make hotter air. So, you know, we experience heat issues with heat management. Um, exhaust fans, um, keeping up with the demand. Filter cleaning is huge because that's a huge restriction in airflow. So um, that's an important part of our, uh, root, again, routines. It, when it rains, we can't do a lot. I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I love helping customers and uptime is the most important thing to me, but um, you know, I, I can't care. I can't move computers in the rain, uh, unfortunately. So we are kind of re naturally restricted by some things. And so um, it's very much not Hollywood has done a good job of creating this vision in our mind of what a data center is. Uh, when you have a lot of air movement, you have a lot of natural dust in the air. Um, so we do filter, uh, filter cleaning is huge. Container clean out is huge. Uh, machine clean out is, is very important. These are just uh, things that can get in the way and affect the operation of the machine. We have to wear hearing protection um, because the mines are so loud from hundreds of these machines at over 80 decibels uh, and the exhaust fans uh, move tremendous amounts of air. It's like almost like a wind vacuum in there. So uh, it is very loud. Uh, so hearing protection is is required. Um, if I could, I'd love to jump in and ask you more specifically about the container mining. We see container mining around the world. It seems to be a very good solution. Actually, Cynthia Loomis was talking about this on stage recently i forget at what conference but she was talking about how if you're trying to do you know, a flare a flare off capture and you're trying to do that type of mining you know you can take a 20 or a 40 foot container and bring that out to the energy source and then just connect that and start to capture that energy to be able to to mine bitcoin and i know at the site that you're at in ohio you guys are using container mining so if you could speak to the challenges that maybe container mining have over non-container mining yeah, absolutely. The uh, big difference is the when container mining, you're kind of restricted on the space you have. With this, an existing structure, you're a little more versatile in how many machines you could fit, racking. Ventilation is more of a challenge because it's an ex ex existing structure. 
our containers are, are fabricated with the exhaust fans on them, um, ready to go. So these are kind of engineered to hit the ground running. And the beauty of in the field is you don't need a lot of things for these containers to deploy. Um, so it is cool to see uh, these containers pop up around uh, power facilities around the country and around the world. Um, it's just, it's neat. Um, the big, the big difference that, though is, uh, I, in my opinion, we were able to manage heat better in a mining and a in a shipping container type structure than compared to an exi existing structure. In my experience, a lot of these existing structures are are not built for mining, but they're often repurposed. Um, so a lot of retrofitting and construction has to go into that. Again, our containers are uh, fabricated exclusively for Bitcoin mining, so we kind of uh, took that approach uh, with my site uh, as far as just utilizing the space that we, we were given and um, it just made the most sense for the environment. Yeah, that sounds kind of like a plug and play. You get the container, you put the mine, the miners in, and then you're kind of off and running. I know that that makes it sound simple. And I hope today that we dive into what's not simple. So what's not simple about that? You have a container, it is delivered to you, you throw some miners in it, yeah. you connect it to the energy. What else needs to happen? And the other thing I want to ask specific detail about this is that there's all these different types of miners and different sizes, even, you know, an inch or a millimeter could change the way the rack space and that will work. So when you get the shipping container delivered and you're going to put in miners, what else needs to happen? Because I know that there are a lot of moving parts here and things that need to be taken into account please just like run through those and, and talk to me as though I've never been in a, in an active shipping container mine, uh, because I haven't, <laughs> I've only been in other facilities that, you know, aren't shipping containers. So, you know, break that sure. down. What does that look like? Cause I do know that in the Ohio site you're at, I think we're going to look to, to grow, right? Um, the global hash rate is yeah, growing. Yeah. We're going to grow more people are wanting to host with us. So, Walk me through what's going to happen as you bring on new shipping containers and what that process looks like to, to get a shipping container online. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts. You're right. Um, we have to collaborate with certain agencies, uh, the municipality where, we're, where our site is, our facilities are. Uh, we have to collaborate with electrical contractors to handle the transformer hookup. Once the municipality does their, the utility company does their uh, work as far as the high voltage that gets sent to a transformer, the transformer is then hooked to the shipping container. Um, sometimes things get put on the calendar and they get delayed. Um, obviously, utility companies can't work in bad weather, so um, we've experienced you know natural delays. There's also delays with logistics. Um, getting the container here has been an issue in the past. Um, we've been fortunate to sort those kind of issues out. We also need miners for when the container is ready. Um, so there's logistics around that and the storage of those and the inventory management of those. And then we have the actual uh, act of racking the machines. Um, our containers hold just under, most of our containers hold just under 600 machines. So that's just over one megawatt per container. Um, so it's a lot of, there's a lot of labor that goes into Bitcoin mining, uh, to make it happen. And it's, it's been interesting for me, uh, as a site lead handling customers, uh, interactions, uh, about certain issues with their machines. There's really not a lot of knowledge in the community as far as what happens after they buy the machine. And I think that this is a great opportunity to help. Uh, paint a picture of what Bitcoin mining in the field is actually like. It, it, it It's very rewarding. Um, I love when my site is 100% online. Um, but what we learn is everything is a piece of uh, piece of equipment that can fail. So um, we have challenges throughout the day and throughout the week that that keep us uh, keep us busy. Yeah, so thinking about each container having 600 miners is really something. When I was able to visit one of the facilities in Texas, I remember picking up one of the miners and it weighed about 35 pounds. Now, if you're not aware of like what 35 pounds is, next time you're at the gym, just pick up a 35 pound kettlebell and then take into account that that is worth potentially thousands of dollars. And then you have to move 600 of them 
put them in place, <laughs> plug them in. And then as you said, maintain them, make sure that they're not dusty, make sure that they have good airflow, make sure that they're online. Most importantly, what does the maintenance Definitely. look like day to day? Cause you said, you know, you're a creature of routine. You have to go in and make sure that these 600 machines in one of the shipping containers is, you know, is good to go is online. There's no issues. What does that process look like daily? I know that this is probably a mix of both hardware and then just going and, and looking to see, you know, physically, okay, is that right? Does that okay? Does that match up with what the software is telling me? Yeah, routines are huge. Uh, we start the day with a software check. That's our easiest uh, method of identifying issues. Um, from there, we can create a list of locations we need to go check out physically. There's a lot of vibration in the container with all the fans running and the airflow. So sometimes cables can simply just come unplugged. And um, that's a simple fix that we can identify in that walkthrough. Um, it's also an opportunity to identify if debris has gotten in the container or if anything happened overnight weather-wise. We also take the time to uh, check our customer portal and make sure that we there are no tasks waiting on our action. Um, I like to try and position us every day so that our our tasks are completed and that no work is waiting on us. So we approach every day uh, the same as best we can. And uh, that it just helps us be efficient with our time because we're not there 24 hours a day. Yeah, the 24 hour nature of having these machines online, I think presents opportunities, right? And so I would love for you as a site lead to talk about the challenges that you face. Cause the story in my head is there's the weather component, right? If it's 110 degrees out, as opposed to if it's 20 degrees out, the weather may affect the container may affect the overall miners. And we see that for example, in Texas, a lot, we see curtailments, right? Off the fact that Bitcoin mining is probably the biggest flexible load on the planet is one of the pluses for energy. So that is an opportunity. Um, and what are, I guess, some of the challenges that Bitcoin mining presents and how are you able to address them as a site lead? On the ground, we're seeing a lot of uh, new deployments of uh, more efficient machines. Um, obviously, with the difficulty of the blockchain increasing, people that do mine Bitcoin become concerned about profitability and the efficiency of those machines uh, moving forward after the halving. Um, so we are seeing a lot of upgrades. Um, a lot, we're moving a lot of machines on site um, as people in, buy the newest technology. So we are uh, very active in in the growth of the blockchain currently, just based on the newest technology and obviously the having having its effect on the mining. Yeah, it's actually kind of crazy that we're in a post having environment because for so long before I joined Compass and since I joined Compass, the having was the thing that was like the I I liken the having to the hundred meter dash at the Olympics. You train for four years for it and then within ten yes. seconds it's over. Right. And it's like, how did you do? Yeah. And then there's the after, but unlike that analogy, the after having where we are right now, Bitcoin price maybe isn't where people want it to be. The difficulty I think is going to decrease this week, but overall hash rate, you know, is moving up. Things are getting really competitive and profitability, as you mentioned, is definitely something that's on the forefront of every single Bitcoin miners mind. Right. So how does that influence your work? day to day. Are you guys thinking about the difficulty? Are you thinking about, you know, now the block rewards 3.125 as opposed to 6.25 or are you more, you know, we are the, we are the trees. Um, and that's more of the forest. That is the larger conversation that is probably happening. My mandate as site lead is just to make sure the machines are online or as Bitcoiners, you guys also talking about that. I, I'm just curious about how, what that looks like. As a Bitcoin miner myself, I take uptime pretty personally because, um, that's what we're all about. Um, if we're not online, we're, what are we doing? So I, uh, I take a very personal investment in everything at my site. I want all my machines online. I want all these people to be able to reap the rewards of their investments. So from a day-to-day -day perspective, we worry less about uh, the difficulty or the reward amount and more about helping support the network infrastructure, help support the Bitcoin blockchain by getting more machines online and continuing to push this to the mainstream. Yeah, you, you've talked about the upgrades of the newer miners. And I think as the industry grows, and this is just kind of my personal opinion on this, I think as the industry grows, 
we're going to not only see more ASIC manufacturers basically coming out trying to like you know get the two percent ahead of the next person which is good competition overall is good that's going to get us a more refined product when any product comes out if it's the first one out it needs other products to kind of push it along right to make it better we're seeing that right now especially in the electric vehicle uh, industry where china has certain electric vehicles that are competing with tesla and have actually i think overtaken tesla as far as overall sales and as these upgrades continue to happen, I wonder often, you know, because I think for the customer and even for myself, who's not around a mine every day, it's like, you know what, Jeff, we've got a new machine. This new machine has come in and I'm not even thinking, OK, this has different dimensions. This is going to throw off the entire rack design and rack space of what they're trying to do. But I think for the customer and maybe somebody on the outside who's just looking at it theoretically, they're like, Jeff, what are you doing? Just put the miner in. And you're like, no, I have to move 600 miners right. in a different configuration because of the ventilation, because of where we need to plug in each one to the power. Are these challenges that are happening or continue to happen or things that you are thinking about as a site lead? Definitely. We are experiencing this now. Uh, as a, the consumer may not know, but the new generation machines, the S21s in particular, they draw more power than their predecessors. So... I, one of my responsibilities as site lead is to make sure that our energy distribution in the container is balanced. With imbalance uh, across the three phases, we can have electrical issues, explosions, etc. So this new generation of machines has created, um, it's forced us to reorganize and change the way that we just place the, the machines in the container. We can't just arbitrarily throw them wherever. We have to be strategic with the with the machine's power draw versus where we place it so that there is that balance and that harmonious electrical piece that we need to, to stay online. Um, so we're experiencing that now with the new generations of machines. Um, we're actively moving uh, machines and containers, uh, trying to accommodate the new demands. Um, we can only probably expect as the machines uh, hash rate increases that the power draws probably going to increase as well. So this is going to be something that's ongoing in the mining industry is, uh, again, circling back to that energy management. Yeah, with growth in any industry are going to come new challenges. And I think even as simple as, yeah, you know, the S21s need a different configuration. So now I have to, you know, move all of my Legos or miners to be able to make that work. These are just small things that I think are really good to hear and really good to share publicly, because these aren't things that I think people take into account. And I think that knowing that there's so many things behind the scenes and different levels is really great. And then also you've talked about, as we talked about earlier, the development of a site, you need to coordinate with both public and private companies to kind of make these thing happen. This is, <laughs> these are not things that I think we normally think about when we just think about the Bitcoin network. So this has been really great as you look forward, both as a Bitcoin miner yourself, and then as a site lead at a Bitcoin mining company, what are things that excite you about the future of Bitcoin mining uh, and where it's going? Great question. I think the most exciting part is the increased adoption over time. Um, we've seen this year, the ETF has already triggered a, a large surplus of activity in the Bitcoin uh, network. So uh, we just excited to see that continue to grow, um, excited to grow my site um, and just bring more people to Bitcoin. It, it's a great, it's a great place to be. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. And I want to thank you for hopping on today and talking a little bit more like behind the mine or behind the scenes. I don't think that some of the things that you've spoken about today are necessarily evident for people that are looking at Bitcoin mining from the outside and that aren't around a mine every day. You know, these are the amount of people. And I said this to you that are probably in and around a mine, a Bitcoin mine, even globally today is probably a very small number compared to the people that even work in the mining industry and are definitely part of the overall Bitcoin network. So thank you so much for hopping on. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, or you're listening to this on YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe. Follow us on X, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube for more of this content. Jeff, thank you so much for hopping on today. And I look forward to hopefully getting out to your Ohio site. Yeah, thank you again for having me, Jared. This has been a great opportunity to share a little bit about Bitcoin mining and excited to get you out to the site and get you in the mines.